Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. Thanks for joining me tonight on the live Umqua event. This will be streaming through Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. After tonight's session, you'll be able to see each one of the flies on YouTube with Umqua Feather Merchants. You'll be able to see them later on my YouTube channel, Land and Mare Fly Fishing. I'm happy to share some of the great designs tonight, which are going to be the Tube Midge, the Titan Tube Midge, the Mini Leech Jig, and the new addition to the Umqua family, the Mini Leech Jig Damsel, which I'm happy to share that with all of you. And we'll have those at the ready for the summer season ahead. I can't believe it's already 2021. It's going to be a great start to a new year. I appreciate all the support from Umqua, Russ, Jake, Sam, everybody involved to make this possible. And all the questions you have, bring those in tonight after you see the designs and the way that they're made. I'll be happy to answer any of those for all the sessions you see this evening. We'll go over some rigging, colors. It's all out there for everybody to enjoy. And again, I really enjoy being able to share all this information with everybody. So we'll get started here. We'll have a chance to check out the different designs, step-by-steps in the tie. Colorations are gonna be for the tube midge in red. The Titan tube midge is gonna be black and red. The mini leech jig is in the Radiant series with the orange bead, black body which is gonna be awesome for the spring season coming up. And the mini leech jig, we tied in olive for the damsel limitation. So the mini leech jig damsels in olive, but that's also available in tan, and that's in the size 16. So I hope everybody enjoys. We'll have a chance to watch all the programs tonight. The flies being tied and I'll answer any questions afterwards. And again, happy new year. Great to see everybody. I hope you're having success and I hope these flies bring you more success on the water. So thanks again for joining us tonight. Hello everyone, I'd like to show you my very first creation I submitted to Umqua Feather Merchants and that is the Tube Midge. A very simple, easy design, minimal materials and steps. It's also a very durable and a versatile fly, whether you're in the cold or the warm seasons pursuing quality trout. Cool thing about this design, starting out with the hook, is I'm a fan of using the new hook with Umqua and that is the XT040 the JB Emerger hook. The nice thing about this hook is it has an up eye and an offset hook point. So that way you get a lot of penetration when you're dealing with smaller bugs and larger quality trout. It's really a great design and works very well. Sizes 18, 20, 22, and even all the way down to 24. Now the body is very unique. There's a love and hate relationship with the body and I'm gonna explain why. The body of this design for the tube midge starts with small wire, and you can see it here. The cool thing about small wire is that it's very versatile in how many color selections you can choose from. Next to that, we're going to insert the small wire into clear microtubing. And the advantage by doing this is we're going to give this midge a look as if it's clear and it has segmentation through the body. That's important because if you ever seen midges from the river, you see them in hand, they look clear and they also possess segmentation. That's what this fly and imitation really does represent well. For the head, we're gonna have the bead and behind that we'll just have a simple thread base for a thorax to build up. You can also add a tuft for an emerging midge. You can have a gill tuft coming out the front of the bead. Sky's the limit there. And in addition to the tungsten bead, which we're gonna to use today, size 1.5, you could use plastic or you could use brass really is whatever you prefer as far as designing the fly. And the biggest thing to remember is that you wanna make sure that you're controlling depth. I prefer using weighted flies over split shot because it allows your rig to appear more natural. Now the way to insert the wire into the tubing is you wanna stab it, just like you'd put tippet through the eye of the hook. We're gonna stab the wire into the tubing and then we'll simply twist the tubing back onto the wire. And when we do this, we're going to create what I call sticks. So I have one and a half inches or two inches of tubing and inserted into that is four to five inches of wire. Each one of these sticks will twist up about three to four midges and you can mix and match the color to whatever you prefer. 
We're doing clear and red to look like a red midge in the water. You could do black, you could do copper. You could also do cream and green and make this look like a small caddis pupa, which makes this a very versatile imitation. So to start out at the bend of the hook, we're going to place two wraps of wire. But to do this, first I want to pinch opposite side of the wire that we're going to attach. And right at the transition of wire to tubing, we're going to pinch on that with our thumb and index finger. This prevents the tubing from spreading back or sliding back on top of the wire and keeps everything in place. Then at the bend of the hook, I'm going to perform one wrap with the wire second wrap with the wire, and then I'll continue forward with the wire and tubing. And by doing this with loose wraps, I get a nice even segmentation on the body, as you can see there. It really does look like a small midge, and I really do love the segmentation. Now once we're to this point, we can grab both tag ends, place them to the left and out of the way. The nice thing is because you're dealing with wire and tubing, they'll move to the left. Then we'll come in with the thread, Keeping a taut tag in, I'm simply going to bend that around the hook shank behind the bead, wrapping back towards the bend and wrapping forward towards the bead. And I'm going to go back and forth here a few times and just build up a nice even collar. Now at this point, you can break the thread, which you'll see here to where it's nice and flush against the hook shank. I warn you, if you break thread while it looks cool, there is a chance it could fall apart. Remember, we're all human. And the other thing to remember too is I do not recommend attempting inserting the wire into the tubing post IPA. That's definitely a pre IPA step. So always keep that in mind for the winter season. So when you're dealing with this step in the tie, you're going to grab the tag end of wire and tubing. We're going to bring this forward. I'm then going to perform one loose wrap, a second loose wrap, and then switch to my dominant hand and secure wrap twice. I'll then grab the tag end of wire and tubing and I'm going to cut that as flush as possible right against the hook shank behind the bead, and I'm going to push that down just to make sure it's all secure. Then at this point, we're simply just going to build up a nice thick collar and black thread. You could also here add a tuft out the back. You could do a gill tuft before going forward. And once we wrap here three to four times, I'm then going to come back with the whip finish tool. I'm going to whip finish once, whip finish a second time, build up a nice even collar again behind the bead. And the trick here is I'm gonna grab the blade of the scissors and I'm gonna keep that thread taut and I'm gonna slice it like bread below the hook. That's gonna allow that thread to lift up and disguise itself against the hook shank. And you'll notice we still have the tag end of wire on the back. All I'm gonna do at this point is I'm gonna grab the tag end of small wire. I'm gonna helicopter counterclockwise until the brakes flush against the hook shank. I'll then grab that small piece of wire and I'm going to dip that into Loctite super glue. And what that's going to do is gives me small droplets of super glue. And that's the reason we leave those two tag ends of wire on the bend of the hook is that's going to help that secure that glue right to the hook shank and make your fly durable. I find that Loctite super glue is the most secure super glue for some of your smaller flies. And it doesn't fall apart, flake off, doesn't break off the hook shank, and it also remains clear. I'll then also, in some steps, you don't have to necessarily do this for every design, but I'll then wipe Loctite super glue on top and on both sides and underneath of the bead. And all that's going to do is just secure this fly down, make it look wet, give it a lot of sheen and shine, and make sure that it's incredibly durable whenever you're fishing it on the water. And the final result is what you see there. The tube midge in red, it's available 18, 20, and 22 with Umqua. Color range is red, copper, and black, and it really is a very versatile and durable fly. I hope it brings you success on the water. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed that session there with the tube, Mitch. One of the biggest questions I receive about this fly is how the design came to be. And it, it sounds cliche, but literally sleeping one evening, I woke up the night before and the day before we had, had a, a class, a 101 class on the water. We were teaching anglers about bugs, especially during the cold season. It was early spring. We had quite a few midges in the seine. Whenever you say in a river system or you're saining natural food supplies, when you look at them in the seine, you automatically see what they look like in the water when you're picking it up and then out of the water as well. And I noticed immediately 
how the fly looked in the water. It looked like it was clear with segmentation. So I decided that night, I thought, man, what if I could insert wire into tubing, wrap it on the body, figure out a way to secure it on the bend of the hook. And next thing you know, boom, that was the result. It was a great imitation, very durable. And with that Loctite super glue, it really does make a difference. And as a full-time guide, I can crank out dozens of these flies and they can match midges. If I turn them green, they can match caddis larva. Sky's the limit for your home waters, but that's how the design came to be. And I really have enjoyed it and it's been a great tool in the water. As far as the buoyancy of the fly, the big question I receive is, do I tie it with the tungsten bead? Do I tie it without a tungsten bead? And I prefer tying the tungsten bead. I also tie it with just the thread head and also the gill tuft coming out of the front of the fly. Now, when I do this, my lead fly is typically the weighted fly. And then down from that, I'm going to have that drifting near the river bottom or the reservoir bottom. Above that, an unweighted fly acts like the other stage of the midge where you have a pupa, then the pupating midge, and it really does represent different food supplies. So that's some of the ways I'll design it to where you can tie it with a plastic bead, brass, or tungsten to be effective. I downsized the tubing based on the fly itself. As far as the design is concerned, if I'm going from a 20 to a 22, I can tie it all the way down to size 26. The match for the material and the question coming in right now is do I change the size of wire and the size of tubing? When I'm tying the tube midge, I still keep it small wire inserted into micro tubing. And by doing that, I can downsize it all the way to a size 26. You wanna change the odd of your thread when you do that and in many situations, you're going to be tying from 8 aught down to 10 aught, and then even going all the way down to some of the silk strands with Simplify, and you can tie those in size 26 and even a little bit lower if you need it. I typically do 20s, 22, 24, and size 26 when I'm changing up my rigs for the tube niche. And for color combos, the ones that I designed for Umqua were copper, black, and red. Another question I've had is, when I'm tying my flies and I'm setting up my rigs for the tube midge, I'm a fan of using different color variations. So I'll do black and then I'll do red, or I'll do black and then I'll do copper. And the reason I'm doing that is to determine whether the trout wants to key in on an attractor color or if they're looking for a natural food supply. But once I determine the color, I then know that's the fly I can use and I'll switch it up from the tungsten bead and then either the gill tuft or just the thread head so I have different water columns that I'm drifting in. And that really does make a huge difference whenever you're tying the tube midge. Another question I received also is, as far as hooks that you're using, then the hook that you wanna use, I prefer is the 1040, the XT series, the JB Emerger with Umqua. The cool thing about that hook, as you saw in the video, it has the up eye, but then it also has the offset hook point. And I can't tell you how many times I've had anglers hook up on fish or I have myself. Smaller size flies, 24, 26, you hook the fish, a couple head shakes during the fight, and the fly dislodges. And you think, man, there's no way I'm going to get them in. The great thing about this barbless is that that hook point penetrates more, almost like a circle hook, and really does stay attached to the trout's mouth. So it makes a huge difference. And I found, especially when tying your midges, having that up eye, gives you that larger hook gap. So you really do keep that in place in the trout's mouth. It makes a huge difference. And again, it's always fun going out in the winter season. Don't forget though, the winter season is about fooling that selective trout, not always about the numbers. A lot of these fish are lethargic. So everything you do in your motion, match it to the slower motion of the trout as well, please. So it really does make a big difference. But again, coloration, hook size, all of that makes a difference. And when you're dealing with the tube midge, each one of those strips that you have of wire in the tubing, what I refer to as sticks, just know those can crank out anywhere from three to four midges a piece. You can prepare your station and then have those ready to tie it. I hopefully that will bring you more success during the winter season and moving into the spring. We're getting closer, starting to get some warmer days. Hopefully we have some more snow to come as well, but I appreciate everybody's questions and and asking that information about the tube, Mitch. I hope it brings you more success on a regular basis. Next up, we're gonna go with the Titan Tube Midge. So I hope you enjoy the Titan Tube Midge. It's the big brother of the Tube Midge, the Coronamid series. 
If you have not fallen in love with the still waters, I recommend you do so. Some of the largest trout in the world are found there. And it's also fun. It's not always about being in the middle of a deep body of water. A lot of these fish are no joke, 15 to 20 feet off the bank, giving you sight fisher opportunities. It's really a blast. So I hope you enjoy the black and red Titan II, Mitch, coming up next. I'm going to share now with you the Titan tube midge, the big brother version of the tube midge tied on a 2302 with a 332nd tungsten bead sizes 14, 16, and 18. This is a great chronomid imitation. Not only does it work well in still waters, but it can also work well in rivers for migratory fish. And just as we did before on the tube midge imitation, the body is designed out of two pieces of wire. And again, I warn you, this has to be performed pre-IPA, not post-IPA <laughs> for those around the holiday season. But you wanna stick the two pieces of small wire into a piece of midge tubing clear. Difficult to do at first, but all you're gonna do is stab the pieces into the tubing and then twist the tubing counterclockwise back onto both pieces of wire. And this allows you to create the body. I'm a fan of matching segmentation like you would on the midge, but for coronamids, you wanna match even more segmentation by mixing up the colors. That's what we're doing there. So we're gonna start out with this stick, and the stick is usually two inches of tubing and then four to five inches of double wires. And I'll pinch on the opposite side of where I'm going to place the wire on the body of the fly. And then at the bend of the hook, I'm going to perform one, two, and a third wrap of wire and tubing, and then moving forward with the wire and tubing. Sorry, two, three wraps of the wire on the bend, and then continuing moving forward with the wire and tubing. And by doing this, I'm placing a nice even segmentation on the body and trying to keep it as secure as possible, which you can see there. Now, when we stop at this point during the wraps, we're going to place the tag in of wires and tubing to the left. Then I'm gonna come in with white ADOT uni thread, and I'm gonna build up a nice collar base behind the bead. I'm gonna go back all the way to the wire and tubing and then moving forward all the way to the bead. I'll go back and forth once. I'll cut the tag end of that thread fairly close. And then after doing that, I'm gonna wrap the thread back towards the wire and tubing and then bring the tag end forward. And I'm gonna perform one loose wrap and then perform a second loose wrap and then switch to my dominant hand and I'm going to secure wrap two to three times, making sure that everything is flush against the hook shank. Now with the tag end of wire and tubing, I'm going to cut it a little bit higher than flush with the hook shank. I wanna leave a little bit of a tag in there that I can mash down and push forward. And the reason I'm gonna do that is I'm going to wrap on top of that towards the bead and it helps the bead preventing it from sliding back onto the hook shank and it also gives me a smooth runway when I decide to build the collar. Now, many coronamids on the market, you'll see them with white beads to use as a gill tuft representation or an attractor. Instead, we're doing a black bead because we're going to build a nice attracting motion and setup of a collar using white ostrich. Before that, though, I would like to add a little bit more flash to the design. So we're going to put in a, lar a piece of large pearl tensile, Beavis large pearl tensile. I'm gonna cut that to a fine point. I'm then on my side of the hook shank gonna loose wrap once and then secure wrap all the way up towards the bead and then wrapping back towards the bend. Once I do this, I'm gonna stop and then using my thumb and index finger on my dominant and non-dominant hand, I'm simply gonna do one secure wrap with the tensile behind the thread on top of the wire and tubing and then place it on top of the thread to secure it down. And the reason we wanna do that is that with two loose wraps here, I'm then going to secure wrap twice. But you notice it gives a little bit of flash on the backside of the fly, and it allows you to build up the collar. So this acts like even more of an attractor than the ostrich would. I'll cut that flush. I'll then add the thread base. Again, a smooth runway, no potholes, bumps, or valleys. I'm gonna wrap all the way back just on top of the tensile. 
And this is where I come in with a piece of ostrich, and this is what we're going to build the collar out of. Now, the cool thing when you're dealing with ostrich is that it really does hold its form and supplies maximum movement in the water. The secret in making sure that you get even wraps is that it has a spine. You want the material to the left and you want the spine facing the eye of the hook. That way when I place it on my side of the hook shank, I'm going to perform one loose wrap here, let go and make sure that spine's facing the eye, and then secure wrap moving forward. And again, this is going to build up the collar to add a lot of motion and life to the fly and still represent white. So it's a great attractor in front of that tinsel. So then I'll grab with my thumb and index finger, again, like we did with the tensile. I'm just going to do one loose wrap, then secure wrap forward. And I'm going to do this two or three times till I build up a nice even collar. I'll then do one loose wrap behind the bead, a second loose wrap behind the bead. Then I'll switch and I'm going to use my thumb and index finger and comb the material back. Again, I'm just going to wrap that a couple times behind the bead, but you can see what happens there. You build up a nice flared out collar. And then I'll cut the tag end of this fairly close and flush. We'll clean it up a little bit afterwards, but you want to flare that out to the best of its ability just to give it a nice look, but also know that you have enough material to where it's going to breathe. Once we have that material in place and we believe it's going to breathe and it represents that collar, we'll come back in. We're going to whip finish a couple times here, securing the fly down. One whip finish, come back, do that a second time, whip finish. And you can see just how unique that collar is. Now just imagine that below the surface, how much that's going to pulsate and undulate and really add a ton of life to this fly. It adds a lot of movement, a lot of motion, and you can see with that flash behind, it's just that extra bit of flare and attractor for those fish to really key in on. So now what I'm gonna do is here is I'm gonna grab both tag ends of the wire at the bend of the hook. I'm going to helicopter counterclockwise until those break flush against the hook shank and do that once. Come back and do that on the red. And again, we're trying to get them to break as flush and as close as possible. If there's any leftovers, you can use your fingernail, push those down, make sure they're flush against the bend of the hook. And the reason we're gonna look at the bend here is that this is where we're gonna take one of those tag ends of wire. And we're gonna dip that into Loctite super glue so we get micro droplets. I'm gonna place those droplets right on top of the two to three wraps of double wire. And then I'll grab one more micro droplet and I'm going to place that right on top of the thread behind the bead and the finished project is what you see there the black and red Titan tube mitch great chronomid imitation adds a lot of flare a lot of movement and I like the tungsten bead and oftentimes I'll fish this on a loop knot and the reason I fish this on a loop knot is that the fly is going to lift and drop. So you're going to hit that horizontal position where a lot of the moving insects and still waters are, and it really does trigger many takes, in addition to the rivers as well. I wish you the best with this imitation on all the waters you fish. Hello, everybody. Thanks for watching the Titan Tube Mitch. I get excited when I watch that clip. And the reason for that is I always love the transition of rivers to still waters or still waters to rivers. And that really is how the Titan Tube Mitch came to be. When I designed the Tube Mitch as one of my first imitations that I sent into Umpqua, I realized quickly in hunting quality trout, not only in still waters, but fish that moved in the river systems from still waters, that's a very important part of their diet. And just remember for migratory fish, if they move into a river system, they're doing so with the mindset that they still are accustomed to eating still water food supplies. That's why the Titan tube midge works so well. I went through the trial and error and at my beginning designing stages, I actually tied this with two sticks, two pieces of wire inserted into microtubing. So small wire inserted into microtubing, then tying on two sticks. What I realized, if you look close at chronomids, the segmentation is quite thick. So I realized quickly that you can take two pieces of wire, insert them into midge tubing, not the microtubing, and that gives you the proper segmentation to match the chronomid. I tie them in sizes ranging 10 all the way down to 18. I literally last February was up at Pyramid Lake and we had a midge hatch that was popping off and we were catching fish on size 18 midges, fish up to 15, 20 pounds. And then you go back to our home waters here in Colorado, 
an 11 mile reservoir, they look like hummingbirds. These things are giant. They're like a size 10. So it makes a huge difference in having both in your box. And you can be effective on rivers and still waters alike in using these designs. Another question that came in on Instagram and also on Facebook that I'm seeing here, the buoyancy of the flies. So I develop a tier system, which I use in my video mastering the short game that's available on the website. And the reason I say that is I have a graphic set up. If I'm trying to achieve depth, the beauty of the tube midge and the Titan tube midge in larger form is that the wire in the tubing supplies weight. So instead of using a split shot on your rig and then having a fly trailing off to where that appears natural, unnatural, sorry, to a selected trout, you remove the split shot and all of a sudden you have the weighted fly. And then that weighted fly, whether it's a tungsten tube or it's a tube midge or a gill tuft, the weight of the body is going to allow that sinking ratio so it's not buoyant on the surface, it's naturally going to sink. The deeper you want the flies when you add the weight. And the weight can be a plastic bead up to three feet, a brass bead up to five feet, and then for eight feet in depth and even further down, a tungsten bead. And that's the beauty of manipulating weight to match your depth control whenever you're nymphing to selective trout. Keep that in mind. And the, the rigs and the way that I set up the color scheme is I love black and red. It's my go-to color combo for the Titan tube mitch. Next to that is going to be black and silver and also copper and red. But sky's the limit here. And just remember, for everybody designing flies or everybody looking at this invitation, there's over 17 colors of wire and I think over 12 colors of tubing. So you can mix and match by placing them both in one another to where you can match the food supply for your waterways or your home waters, whether it's rivers or still waters alike. The last thing I'd like to share about this imitation, a question coming in about hook selection. Originally, I tied this on a 200R. And what I found with the 200R is it's a great hook as long as its size is smaller than 16. When we were hooking these large trout that no joke would smoke you all the way into your backing, I realized quickly that I need the down eye on the hook to allow the 2X long shank to remain strong. That's why the 2302 from Tiemco, which Umqua supplies, is the go-to hook. It's 2X long on the shank, gives a straight curvature of the midge, and most of your food supplies and still waters are not curved. These are straight food supplies. So when they're swimming and darting about the water, you really do want to mix and match that motion. That's why that motion of the straight shank really does make a huge difference and allow you more opportunities to catch quality trout on that fly. So I hope you enjoyed that tie. Again, I love ostrich. You're gonna see more ostrich to come. The Titan tube midge, the tube midge itself. Next up, what you're gonna see is the mini leech jig and the radiant series. And the big question I receive about these flies to come. So the mini leech jig is available with Umqua. This is with a black bead and it's tied black, it's tied olive and it's tied brown. And I worked with Dave Student in the past and we designed some of these color schemes and combos. I said, hey, look, there has to be more colors like egg sucking leeches. I can match pink and white. So then after that, we, we birthed the series of the mini leech jig radiant, which is olive on olive. It's rust on rust, black on purple, black on orange. And then we also have white on pink. And the white on pink came to be after fishing in Montana with my good friend and my brother from another mother, Eric Mondragon, showed me the beauty of how well the Ray Charles works on the mighty Missouri River. And that's when I figured, man, that white and pink's a great combo, not to mention it matches some of the white tube jigs that a lot of anglers have success with moving up and down on their home waters. So I hope that info helps. I hope you enjoy the next fly to come, which is the mini leech jig radiant black with the radiant bead in orange. And I'll be happy to answer any questions afterwards. Enjoy. I'd like to demonstrate my mini leech jig imitation from Umqua Feather Merchants. The cool thing about this imitation is that it represents a leech in a jig form. It's a very effective fly tied on an XT500 series 60 degree jig hook. And I love the fact that the eye is extending out, not 90 degrees, but at 60 to give you a larger gap, allows you to penetrate the job more and keep more fish connected. I believe it's always leech season and the advantage to this fly is that it can be used and retrieved as a streamer. It can be hanging below a dry fly. 
It can be an anchor fly in a Euro rig or an indicator style nymph rig. Sky's the limit. And it's available with Umco on black and orange, black and purple, white and pink, rust on rust, and olive on olive. Five different color schemes that can supply success in all the seasons throughout the course of the year. Now, starting off with this imitation, we're going to use orange this time. We're using a radiant slotted tungsten bead, again, on a 60 degree jig hook. And with ADOT black uni thread, I'm simply going to start the process and build up a nice smooth runway right behind the bead. I'm just basically building up a flat collar and at some point eventually stopping the bead from coming back and keeping it secure against the hook shank. It may take four or five times here, but once you build up that collar, I'm then going to extend back and placing the tag end up at an angle get nice, smooth, uniform, symmetrical, clean wraps all the way towards the bend, stopping just above the hook point or the bar. I'll then at this point break off that thread, nice, clean, and flush against the body. Now I want a little bit of flash on the body, but I don't want it to be overkill. So I'm gonna use a piece of crystal flash. And I'm a fan of using crystal flash over flashaboo because it gives it some sheen and shine but it's not overkill. So I'm gonna grab a piece of crystal flash about four to five inches. I'm going to bend that around the thread, elevate the thread up, and I'm gonna slide this down to the hook shank. I'll then secure wrap back two or three times on this and secure wrap forward all the way towards the bead and then wrapping back and stopping. The advantage here is that when I secure wrap this, as I wrap the crystal flash forward, it's not going to twist all over the thread and the hook shank, it's gonna stay secure. So I'm then going to use my thumb and index finger, my dominant and non-dominant hand, and I'm simply going to secure wrap moving towards the bead, building up a nice clean body, a little bit of sheen and a little bit of shine. Once I do that seven, eight times, I'll then loose wrap once, loose wrap a second time, secure wrap twice, and I'll grab the tag end of Crystal Flash and I'm going to cut that flush right against the hook shank. Wrapping the thread back again towards the bead and back towards the bend, stopping right at the starting point of the Crystal Flash. I'll then come back with my favorite material now, and that is Micro Pine Squirrel. The first time I noticed this material, I simply fell in love with it. And in fact, this imitation came from a trip I took with John Barr up on the North Platte with cowboy drifters and we were fishing slump busters and at the end of the day so many of the fish crushed the slump buster that we ended up having some of them where the wire broke and then that rabbit would extend off the front or the eye of the hook and it gave me a great idea in a smaller form and doing the same thing for a leech so we're going to grab one piece about an inch to an inch and a half of the micro pine squirrel in black i'm going to clean the skin on the front side to match the distance and the length of the collar. And again, you can mix and match this, create your own, but I'm trying to make sure I have about the same length from the starting point of crystal flash to the bead. Now, unlike my mini leech, I'm going to have the skin facing up away from the hook shank. And the reason I want this in the design is it slows the sinking ray down, making this more effective below dry flies, but it also prevents fouling on the actual hook point or the gap of the hook. Now, once I get to this position, I'm simply going to do one loose wrap and then leave the material in place. And when I turned 18, I took a shower, all my hair fell out. So this is my excuse to work with a hairdo. So once that skin's placed up behind the hook shank, I also want to determine, make sure that material is not too close to the bead. I don't want to crowd the eye. Then I'm just going to simply secure wrap. And if need be, you can always twist back and make sure I build up a nice, flat, smooth runway behind the bead. And by doing this, I then make sure that I can perform the next step in supplying the ostrich hurl. So you can see below, there's a little bit of flash extended out. The material is extended up and behind. I have a nice smooth runway built up behind the bead to make sure that everything's nice and secure. And then lastly, I'm going to come back with another great material I'm a huge fan of, and that is ostrich. Now, when you're using ostrich hurl, the unique part about this material is that it holds its form below the water surface, but it also has a lot of movement and breathability to it. So it's great for a collar. And in this situation, it's going to represent the head of the leech. Once I clean what I call the spine, the trick here is that we wanna make sure the spine is facing the eye of the hook 
and the material is facing the bend of the hook. That way when I supply one loose wrap to make sure this is the case, every wrap moving forward, I know that the material will flare out to the left towards the bend and I'm gonna have a nice straight tall collar. So at this point using the thumb and index finger, I'm gonna trade off, I'm gonna build my collar, moving all the way towards the bead, nice clean even wraps and again the goal here is to represent the head of the leech and you're going to work this all the way up to directly behind the bead once i get to this point i'm going to do one loose wrap then i'll grab the material switch and do secure wraps two or three times making sure that i have that nice tall head nice tall collar i'll come back with the scissors and i'm going to cut that tag in fairly close make sure i don't have too many stragglers then i'll come back with the whip finish tool at this point and I want to whip finish, making sure that all of my thread wraps are going right against the bead so it's clean on both sides. So I'm going to do two wraps, secure it down, come back, two wraps, secure it down, lift it up. And then below, I'm going to grab the scissors and I'm going to simply slice it like I'm slicing through bread. Make sure it goes nice and clean and flush against the hook shank. Nice, awesome looking collar. And then to complete this fly, I'm going to take a small piece of wire and I'm simply gonna dip that into Loctite super glue so I get small droplets of, of super glue, and I'm gonna place those directly behind the bead on top of the thread. Make sure everything's nice and clean on this side. If we have any stragglers like we do on this end, I can always cut those flush and clean. Once we do that and I have that super glue in place, I'm gonna do the same thing on the bend of the hook. And what I'm gonna do is grab another small piece of wire for the bend of the hook, get one drop of Loctite super glue, and I'm just gonna lift up the micro pine squirrel, place this right at the connection point of the crystal flash and the hook shank. Make sure you blow on that a little bit, allow it to dry. And the completed product is what you see there. The mini leech jig, black and orange, also represents an egg sucking leech. An awesome imitation, not only on dry flies and indicator rigs, but also used as a streamer. You can see just how well this thing moves through the water how large the collar is, how it represents the head, tapered fin, and it really does supply great movement. I hope it brings you all success on the water. Hello again, thanks everybody for watching the Mini Leech Jig Radiant Series in black and orange. When you get a chance, be sure to remember a lot of this is available on the YouTube channel. So when we're done all of this, you can see these ties extending through the YouTube channel, which will be available for days to come. Great opportunity to see the step-by-step -step ties. and It really does make a huge difference in having more success when you're using a lot of this. The thing to remember about the mini leech jig and what I love about this imitation is that you can use it below a dry fly, you can use it as an anchor fly in a nymph rig, and you can also use it as a streamer imitation when attached using a loop knot. It makes a huge difference whenever you're dealing with some of the selective trout and trying to be successful with a lot of those fish on a regular basis. Next up, we're going to have the mini leech jig damsel. Hello, everybody. I might be cutting out a little bit with that action. Hopefully, that's some rain or snow to come and bring the flows up. Next up, we're going to have the mini leech jig damsel, the great imitation that just came out with Umqua Feather Merchants and Olives. I hope you enjoy this video footage and the tie, and I'll be happy to answer any questions to follow afterwards. And again, this is an olive available now with Umqua Feather Merchants. And it really has become my go-to for the summer months for a lot of these active fish in shallow water. So I hope you enjoy this video clip.
I'm happy to share with you my new creation with Umqua Feather Merchants, and that is the Mini Leech Jig Damsel. For those who fish still waters and rivers alike, you realize during the course of the summer season, eventually the fish go in a feeding frenzy, and it looks literally like a killer whale trying to attack its food. These fish are spraying water everywhere, chasing these swimming damsels in water that can be as shallow as six inches. The cool thing about this fly, just like with the mini leech jig, is that you can place it in shallow water below indicators and dry flies, and it's unbelievable just how effective it truly is. The pattern starts with a 60 degree jig hook, the XT500 from Umqua. We're also gonna use a green radiant slotted tungsten bead. Now the one thing we'll add to this, and most importantly to represent the damsel are the eyes. So for the eyes, we're gonna use extra small mono eyes from Hairline. To start the design, I'm simply gonna do two to three wraps of thread right behind the eye of the hook, break that flush, and then do one or two secure more. I'll then grab the small, extra small mono eyes, and I'm gonna place them on my side of the hook shank and perform one wrap, a second wrap, and then turn the eyes and figure eight around the eyes. And this is going to be a way to secure the eyes, again, to represent the damsel and to give it a very unique look. Now, instead of continuing the design, I'm simply at this point going to grab the whip finish tool and I'm going to whip finish off the eyes, making sure that everything is secure and that I have the eyes in place because we are going to eventually supply Loctite super glue. So I'm gonna come back, whip finish with two wraps, right, Underneath the eyes, grab the scissors, cut that tag in fairly flush. I'm then going to come back with small wire and I'm going to supply one or two drops of Loctite super glue, securing the eyes down on both sides. That way we know the eyes are flush and I'll do one more just to be safe below. Making sure everything's secure and eventually when that dries, it's gonna secure the eyes and add more durability to the fly. I'll then grab, open up the jaws, make sure that everything is flush, and I'm going to place the hook down level. And then I'm going to slide the tungsten bead up to directly behind the eyes. And you can see what we've developed here. Now we have the mono eyes represent the damsel eyes, and then we have the bead that's slid forward. And when the bead comes forward, eventually we're going to disguise that in the design and make of this fly. I'll then come back with my thread, and I'm going to build up a nice even path behind the bead to secure it down. Again, I want it as flush as possible against the eyes. And then I'll wrap using the tag end of thread elevated up at an angle 45 degrees, get nice, secure, even and symmetrical wraps all the way towards the bend. I'll then grab the tag end, break that flush here. Then I'll come in with crystal flash. Now I'm a fan of using peacock color crystal flash here. And again, we're trying to build up some sheen and shine on the body but we don't want this to be overkill. So I'll grab a piece about three to four inches in length. I'm going to bend that around the thread, elevate the thread up and slide this down to the hook shank. I'll then secure wrap on top of that moving back two or three times and then wrap that forward towards the bead. Again, building up a smooth runway and then stopping. From here, we're just going to trade off using the thumb and index on both dominant and non-dominant fingers, and I'm gonna wrap this evenly moving forward all the way towards the bead and just building up a nice, even, clean, green segmented body. We want this to be as flush and clean as possible. It's not all going to be shown, just enough to add enough sheen and an attracting shine for the fish to see it as they're swimming the shallows. I'll do three loose wraps. I'm gonna cut that flush towards the hook shank, wrap forward, Get all the tag ends down, again, building up that nice, smooth, clean runway. I'm gonna bring this back a little bit further, and I'm gonna leave a little bit of sheen and shine, but not a ton. And then I'm gonna come in here, I'm gonna grab some resin, and with one or two drops of resin, I'm going to paint that over the body, just building up a nice, even, secure base. You can do it on both sides, top and bottom. Come back with my light, hit that. Secure that down. And once I hit this and secure it down, I then know that I have flash and a durable body because again, these are gonna be very aggressive strikes. Then I'll come back with another piece of my favorite material, the micro pine squirrel. 
And I'm going to leave this relatively long just to show that you can add length to this fly just to represent a lot of movement. So I'm going to grab this piece. Again, I'm making sure that the skin is cleaned and I'm trying to match the distance behind the bead as much as possible. This is going to extend a little bit further back than we have on the mini leech jig or the mini leech. But I'm simply going to flip the skin like we did before, place this on top of the hook shank behind the bead, perform one loose wrap, give that little mohawk a hairdo. For those of you like myself who lost their hair when they took a shower at the age of 18, this is a chance to give yourself a hairdo. We're going to wrap that skin forward towards the bead. Again, try to build up a nice, smooth, even runway, enough to where we can secure and also get movement from the ostrich when we supply it later. Now, at this point in the design, if you have any stragglers, anything left over, you can always cut those clean. We're going to move the fly upside down. So I'm gonna take it out of the jaws. I'm gonna flip it, place it back in. And that way we're building the rest of the fly from below. We can't do this from above. So I'm gonna secure wrap back a couple more times and we're gonna build up a nice even thorax and legs representing the legs here of a lot of your swimming damsels. So at this point, I'm going to grab one piece of pre-cut D skin and olive, and I'm going to place that on top of the hook shank. I want it to be flush right underneath the hook point. So right there, you can see I needed to make an adjustment. If you need to make any adjustments, now's the time. I'm gonna wrap that forward towards the bead, wrap this back, securing it two to three times to where it's nice and flush against the back or what's gonna be the back of the thorax of the damsel. I'm then also gonna do the same thing here with a piece of pearl tensile and large, Vivas pearl tensile. I'm gonna build this up as well, making sure that I wrap this on top of the hook shank when the hook is upside down, wrapping this forward towards the bead and then wrapping all the way back again towards the bend. So we have tensile in front of the D skin and then we're gonna come back here with another piece of my favorite material, and that is the ostrich. We'll grab a piece of olive ostrich hurdle, make sure that we've cleaned it off. And again, we want the spine facing the eye of the hook, the material facing the bend. Any leftover stragglers, grab them clean. So I'm gonna place this with one loose wrap, make sure that it's all facing forward, spine towards the eye, wrap this towards the bead itself, then I'll come back with the ostrich and I'm going to wrap this nice and smooth, even wraps moving towards the eye of the hook. And in doing this, you just want to secure every wrap and make sure you're building up the legs nice and clean, nice and even towards the bead. And you can see it's a little bit longer than what we do with the mini leech jig or the mini leech. And the reason for that is you're trying to maximize the representation of legs. Once I get to this point, I'll then secure wrap down with one loose wrap, followed by two or three secured wraps. I wanna make sure all the material's flush, nice and clean. I'll cut that tag in fairly close, blowing it if you need to, cut any stragglers out. A lot of this would be covered up. I'll then grab that tensile, and I'm gonna move the tensile over the top, grab the thread, and work it around the bead and the tensile. So I'll do one loose wrap, a second loose wrap, and then I'm going to secure this down twice. And you can see by doing that, I'm adding a nice bit of flash and I'll leave a little bit longer tag end. And then we'll move the fly a little bit and clean off any stragglers right behind the eye on both sides, just to make sure it's nice and clean. Nice clean representation of legs. So after doing that, here's the secret. So I wanna disguise the bead at this point in the design. And the reason I came up with the idea to disguise the bead is that I wanna make sure everything's secure and clean, but I wanna make sure it represents the head and the body of the damsel. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab the skin, pull it over the top of the eye of the hook, turn the vise and make sure it's measured out correctly. At this point, I'm going to switch to my non-dominant hand and I'm gonna pull down and then use my finger to push up. I'll grab my dominant index finger and with my fingernail, I'm gonna scrape right on top of the eye of the hook. And by scraping here, you get a little jump in movement. You can see that eventually that eye feeds through. Then I'll come back and perform one loose wrap here, which secures the back of the fly down. And then I'm gonna turn 
and then secure wrap behind the bead and underneath. And by doing that, I basically build up the head of the fly. So you can see that one wrap, I'll come back and do a second wrap. I'm then going to come in with the whip finish tool. I'm gonna to secure wrap here twice, once, twice. Secure that down, flush. I'll grab that tight, cut that fairly close right against the D skin. I'm gonna then grab a small piece of wire dip it in Loctite super glue, and I'm gonna place it right on top of the thread and the hook shank there. If you have any stragglers, just try to get those off and free. Nice smooth wipe there. Then I'm gonna turn and do the same thing on the back and underneath. So back and underneath, I'm gonna wipe, make sure I get Loctite super glue in there. I'll grab the scissors, cut that D skin all the way down and flush, turn it back over, and you can see how that represents the legs of the damsel. So now you have the moving legs of the damsel, the extension of the body. And the cool thing about this design when you look at the head is the head represents the eyes and the thorax of the fly. And then you still have the tungsten bead underneath, semi-disguised. And then to complete the fly, I'll come in with a Copic marker and olive, and I'll mark up the eyes. So I'm gonna do one little dot on this side and do the same with the little dot on the opposite side. And that is the mini leech jig damsel. Hello everybody, thanks for having me back. Thanks for watching that last fly in tonight's demo. Now that is a great design and I don't know about you, if you have not experienced the damsel bite, it's incredible, whether it's on still waters, whether it's on rivers, and the big question that came in tonight, and I've been asked this a lot, is how do you determine what color damsel? And just remember, if damsels are living and swimming around vegetation-filled water, a lot of times they're like chameleons, they're going to match their surroundings, they'll be olive. For those sandy shorelines and the still waters or the edge of the river and the rocks, they're going to be tan or brown. So that's where you mix and match the colors based on the terrain that you're fishing. The other advantage when you're using jig flies is just how versatile they can be. A big question coming in is how do I know what discipline to use to match the damsel or to match the leech itself when it's tied jig style? The way that I like to set this up is imagine you're in the river. You have high flows during the summer season and all those fish that are hugging the bank. You feel like you can only cast a dry fly to that fish. Anything below is going to snag the bottom. The beauty of the jig hook on the mini leech jig with the Radiant Series regular or the mini leech jig damsel is that can literally be 12 inches below your drive. And the cool thing about the design is that because the skin is facing away from the hook shank, I can literally drop this fly 12 inches below a size 16 parachute atoms and it won't sink the dry. That's right, even a size 16 small dry, it won't sink it down. That way, when the fish is lifting, coming up to look at the dry, you intercept the fish by using the jig style fly and boom, it's a home run. Not to mention the excitement. Look, I'm getting the shakes right now. When I talk about damsels, man, it's insane. If you ever are out on still waters and all of a sudden you see these fish spraying water everywhere, literally reminds me of the Nat Geo video where the orca whale comes up onto the surf into the beach and tries to chase down the bait fish. It reminds me of these fish trying to attack damsels. They literally spray water everywhere. And the reason for that is that damsels are swimming, literally swimming towards the bank. Just like a stonefly, they break out of their shucks on the bank, dry land, and become the adult. Well, trout know this, and they also realize it's an easy non-escaping meal because they're not swimming fast. So when we drop these below a dry fly, you're literally fishing in six to 12 inches of water. It's incredible. And then like Russ and Jake and Sam, all of us with Umqua Feather Merchants, not only do we design for this company, we all fish together. It's a family. It's a unit. When we went out last year, we saw Russ doing the strip and retrieve, tying it with a loop knot, extending fluorocarbon off an intermediate sinking line, and this imitation stripped in shallow water. Boom. We dropped them below dry flies. We went and casted them out below larger hoppers. The imitations, sky's the limit. It really does work. And that's why I'm happy to share a lot of these flies. Another question that came up tonight was, 
why do you design and how did you design these flies? And the reason I design these flies is to help supply a tool when I'm teaching anglers on the water. That really is why the designs come to be, and that's why I'm sharing it with Umqua. For the damsel hook size, a question just came in from Facebook. The sizes that I use for damsels, and this is very important, on the size 16, I use a 2.3 B. So a large damsel I use early in the season, just like when you're matching the hatch. The trout are not very wary at that point. They're not accustomed to seeing the size of the bugs. They're very eager. You can get away with a larger hook size, which is important because the larger the hook size, the larger the gap is on the hook as well. As the season progresses and the trout become more accustomed to seeing the damsel, I'll downsize. I'll go down to a size 18. Now, when I do that, I also drop the bead size. I drop it to a 2.0 so I can control depth and control size. And you can do that in a variety of ways, whether it's early or late in the season with the hatch, starting in late June, going all the way into September, or you can do that by matching and adapting your weight to ensure that you're not going to sink the dry fly. So just keep that in mind when we're out fishing the damsel flies. And again, for the leeches, the damsels, the whole series, and a question that's coming in now, the series with Amqua is this. We have the mini leech unweighted. My first leech imitation where you have the collar coming off the eye of the hook, and that's supplied in brown, olive, and black. Then we designed the mini leech jig, and that's a jig hook 60 degrees XT500 or the 403 barbless. And that's when we have an anchor fly below on a nymph rig, below a dry fly, or as a streamer when you strip and retrieve. Then we decided a couple years after that, we need to match color combos. The Radiant series with Umqua, that's black on orange, black on purple, olive on olive, rust on rust, and then white and pink. And then now the birth of the new one that just came out this year in January, January the Mini Leech Jig Damsel. And again, great imitation. It's my most, as far as fly design is concerned, it's the most difficult tie. Very numerous steps, various steps, but the reason for it is that we had to hide that tungsten bead. And by doing that, measuring and matching the size of the damsel made all the difference in the world. As far as color combinations to add to the Radiant series in the future, yes, I do. That's a great question. In regards to adding a color combo, my color combo I'd like to add to the Radiant Mini Leech Jig series is a red bead, and I'd also like to match that to black. I also would like to add orange and olive. Those are the two color combos that are coming down the pipeline. And I'll be in talks with Umqua and getting those onto the catalog. Again, black and red and orange and olive. And the reason for that is it's matching the color scheme. This last year in Stillwaters, black and red was awesome. Red's always a great attractor fly in the spring and the fall season. And then as far as olive's concerned, it can match some of these bait fish. It can look like an egg sucking leech. But also identifying two colors that trout are used to seeing supplies more movement and opportunities. So I hope that really does help. And again, these are great questions coming in. It's so great to talk fishing. I can't wait to be out on the water and hit it this week. I'm looking forward to the new year in 2021. I'm very humble in this experience. I really do appreciate everybody's support. Behind me is a photograph that you can see to my left. That's myself and John Barr. He was my big mentor and not only fly design, but fishing. So to be in this position under his tutelage and everything else involved, it really does mean the world. So I really appreciate everybody sitting in tonight. The big question now is the difference in fishing attractors versus coloration that matches the natural. And that's a great question coming in. I use both. So just like when I'm tying on streamers, I like to go with the white streamer and then a darker black streamer. I do the same thing when I'm dealing with attractors or naturals. And a great explanation of that is if I were to use, let's say the bottom flies, a mini leech jig radiant series in olive, that's gonna be a natural imitation what could represent floating debris in the water, vegetation with clumps of food built inside. It can match a bait fish, it could match a leech. And then above that, if I have a different color combo that's drifting, I can determine what color combo naturally the fish want. If I see a trout that I think is aggressive and I wanna change the colors up, I can then go with the white and pink mini leech jig radiant. If the trout doesn't come over and attack the fly but reacts, I can switch to a natural. So I'm constantly searching dark colors for more natural, 
light and bright colors, whether it's a bead or the material. And I determine quickly if the fish are aggressive looking for that bright meal or if they want something natural. Just like when you select midges, black and red, you'll know right away. If they want subtle colors, they'll go to the black. If they want attracting colors, they'll go to the red. And that's all in preparation. For me as a full-time guide, the only way I find success is to prepare for the next day. And that doesn't stop the night before. It's all the way up to the minute you make the first cast. And that way you determine quickly whether or not the fish is into natural or attracting food supplies. And again, I appreciate everybody's uh, Coming into tonight's program, asking the great questions. It's great to tie, share all this knowledge with everybody. I am happy to announce this September, I have my very first fly tying book. The 10 imitations I have with Umqua will be in this book in step-by-step -step ties. Not only do we have the step-by-step -step photographs, we have the history of the fly, how to fish the fly, and to take it up one more level, every fly, it's also had a rig by illustration. So I'm happy to announce that book. You can see it right now on Amazon for pre-order. It's with Lion Stack Pool Books and my good friend Jay Nichols. I appreciate his support on that. You'll see a lot of these rigs and techniques and the issues right now in Fly Fisherman with Scouting Mission. We have some other great articles coming out in Fly Fisherman and High Country Angler. With Umqua Feather Merchants, awesome company. I really do. It's a huge family. Just remember everybody out in the tying world, the great thing about tying is not only does it allow you a chance to develop techniques and strategies, but just like what we talk about in Umqua, it's 100% too true. When you tie, you stay connected to the water. The only way to stay connected to the water is in preparation, and that's done on the vise using regal vices, tie craft desks, hairline materials, sky's the limit. I really do appreciate everybody having me on board. And just remember, don't forget, check out YouTube. Subscribe to the channel with Umqua. Subscribe to the channel with Land and Mare Fly Fishing. There's more of these tips and tricks to come. I do a newsletter every month. I give away free tips there. And again, I'm a believer in giving back. And that's what I think really does make a difference. So thank you so much to everybody. Happy 2021. Woo woo. Sky's the limit this season. Positivity is out.